Well, hello, we are on the front steps of the church about to enter into the sanctuary. Susan and I are gonna be talking about the Adams family today. Yes, and we uh, we're gonna have two windows. Uh, one is right inside the sanctuary. And then the other one is, uh, you might not see it on a Sunday morning, but it's just in the hallway past Bennett Parlors. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we'll take a look at those two windows today. And, and yeah, welcome. And welcome. We're about to go inside. Go inside. Back inside the sanctuary. And we're right next to a beautiful window that you can see that is uh, in memory of Nathaniel Adams and Rhoda B. Adams, erected by John R. Adams. So who are these Adams? Who is this family of Adamses? Well, you might know that Del Mar in the Four Corners uh, used to be known as Adamsville, and Nathaniel Adams and Regina, his wife, um, came out here in the 1830s, about 1836, um, and established a hotel here. And Nathaniel Adams, we know, um, was born in 1802, and he was the proprietor, the owner of a very popular restaurant in Albany called the Marble Pillars, and he saw an opportunity out here. We don't think of Del Mar, uh, the former Adamsville, as being in the country, but in the 1830s there was not much out here. There was the Delaware Turnpike that came from Albany out to points west. There was some scattered farmhouses, but there was travel starting to pick up on that highway or on that turnpike, and Nathaniel saw an opportunity. So he built his hotel here, and it's funny because it was built in 1838, it's just diagonally across the street from our church here. And they, they kind of look a little slim, similar. They're both Greek Revival. They have the big square columns, the triangular pediment. So Nathaniel Adams was here first with his hotel. Maybe DRC copied his design, but that Greek Revival architecture is very popular no matter what. So he had a very thriving business here. Uh, his wife, like I said, was Regina or Regina Balmas. The glass is interesting because it clearly says Rhoda, R-H-O-D-A, but every other reference I have seen to Mrs. Adams has always been Regina. So I'm gonna call her Regina. Uh, they were married in 1825, like I said, he came out here and established his hotel in 1838. Soon the developing village became known as Adamsville, named after this family, and he was the first postmaster um, in 1840, right here. And they raised their family here and they even donated the land that Delmar Reformed Church is sitting on. It was part of their property and they donated it for the erection of the church. So how about John R. Adams? Who's he? Well, he's their son. Uh, he married Louisa Haswell. You might recognize that Haswell name, another famous one. Um, and they had two daughters, Grace and Jessie. And we'll talk a little bit about those two daughters in our next window. Um, and John R. Adams, he helped his father with the hotel and had some other business interests. What I find interesting about him is he kept a daily journal uh, later in life when he was in his 60s. And he specifically wrote this entry on May 15th, 1903. And I'm just going to read it to you. Friday, fair, warm and dry, no rain for a long time. Bill plowing for potatoes, Jim spreading manure. Self in garden and choring. Louise and Grace went to Albany at 109, home at 530, shopping. That's, they got on the train and went into Albany to go shopping. And then this kicker sentence right here. Our memorial window for father and mother was put in the Reformed Church today. Very pretty. So we know the date, May 15th, 1903 is when they put this window in. How cool is that? So the other little fun tidbit about John R. Adams is also in the archives is a copy of one of his checkbooks and you know most of your older viewers will remember checkbooks when you wrote your check stub and one of them on that book is dated may 22nd 1903 and he wrote a check to william b chapman for a hundred dollars for the memorial window so chapman's stained glass window glass studio um, was established in 1898 in albany and it's still in business today so now we know that he paid $100 for this memorial window to his mom and his dad. I just think that's very cool. Um, and then a kind of interesting little connection as well, as sometimes happens when you're a historian, you're researching one thing and you discover something else. Um, I was looking in Alison Bennett's book, The People's Choice, 
Um, you might know or have remember Allison Bennett. She's a former town historian, longtime member here at DRC, part of the Bennett family that we have Bennett parlors. Um, so in this book, I'm looking for something else and I get to one of the pages and there are the portraits of Nathaniel and Regina Adams. And I'm gonna hold them up. Hopefully you can see them okay. It was probably, they were probably made about the time that they got married in um, 1825. And Allison says in her book that they are in a private collection. So I don't know where they are now, but I think it's great that I can show you the faces of the people that are on this window. So that's it for this lovely window. So thank you, Susan, for that wonderful history of the window. And um, if you take a look now at some of the symbols, um, this window is pretty dynamic. Um, you know, typically beforehand, like, I would try and find some sort of running theme with the window. Um, and this one, if you see the symbols, um, they all are kind of a little bit different, a little bit unique. So let's begin up on the top. So what is this um, interesting P and X looking like symbol? So that's actually the Cairo symbol, and it's one of the most historic and earliest symbols for Christianity. It's the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, and it typically represents Jesus and a common uh, representation of the crucifixion. Interesting backstory behind the Cairo symbol is that Constantine, while he was in battle, had a vision, thus inspiring him to be instructed by his Christian faith. And so when the time came for him to go into military battle, he instructed his army to have this symbol on all of their gear as a sign of salvation and safeguard for those who are in battle, which it became very common in the military, but also has now just become a common symbol for Christianity. And it represents that God is victorious and has defeated sin and death. But then you go down just a little bit more and then we have these lovely bells uh, that we see. And bells are typically a symbol for us that we're being called into worship. We see Pastor Chris and Luke uh, ringing the bells for us every week. Um, and so that reminds us to be gathered in. And it actually, if you look at the uh, book of Exodus, um, the rabbis at that time would uh, wear bells on their robes to call others into worship and to let people know that the priest was coming in and coming into this holy place. So, you know, Pastor Chris and I don't wear bells on our robes, but we can uh, recognize that bells are a common form of uh, calling us into worship and um, it's also a reminder to the community. It's our witness um, that God is here and that the people of God are gathering. And then this last symbol, um, I thought it would be appropriate since we are in the season of Easter, um, this looks to be a white lily. And so uh, very common uh, during the Easter season, not so common anymore just because of uh, the strong scent, um, but uh, white is a symbol or color of purity, and the lilies represent rebirth and hope because uh, the way in which lilies grow, um, the bulbs are planted in the ground, and then they stay there for a bit of time, and then they emerge and become beautiful flowers, kind of representing Christ's death and resurrection. And so, uh, there isn't, unfortunately, a running vein for all of these, um, but I do think that this symbol, uh, these symbols on this window are really interesting and have a great history. This is one of my favorite windows. Uh, it's tucked away off of Bennett Parlors, and I just love the simplicity of it. It's very lovely in the morning sun today. But it honors, written in that tiny type up there, it says, in loving memory of Nathaniel A. Blanchard, Killed in the World War, France, November 19th, I'm sorry, November 9th, 1918, erected by Grace H. Blanchard. And I hope you caught that Nathaniel A. He's Nathaniel Adams Blanchard. And Nathaniel, we know, was baptized here at Del Mar Reformed on October 3rd, 1896. Uh, he had been born the previous May. And his mother was Grace Adams Blanchard. And remember, we were just talking about John R. Adams. Um, He's, that's his daughter, so she is a great 
Grant, wait, no, she's the granddaughter. I gotta get this genealogy right. She's the granddaughter of Nathaniel and um, Regina Adams. Her husband was Clarence Blanchard Sr. And so their son was Nathaniel Adams Blanchard. Um, he was born and raised right here in, in Del Mar. And he worked for the New York Central Railroad um, over in Rensselaer before being called up in 1918 to serve during World War I. He left for Camp Wadsworth in South Carolina on May 24th, 1918. And a month later, his regiment, the uh, 307th Infantry, part of the U.S. Expeditionary Forces, uh, they left for France. And he was killed in action uh, shortly before the end of the war. So the date on the glass is when he was killed, which was November 9th. Uh, Armistice was declared November 11th. So very kind of a tragic story for Nathaniel Adams. He was just 22 years old. You might recognize the name of uh, the Blanchard Post, the Nathaniel Adams Blanchard Post. Uh, they're the ones who put on the Memorial Day Parade and do much, so much to support our veterans. Um, every year, they lay a wreath at his stone, at his tombstone um, in Bethlehem Cemetery before the, um, the parade. Even during this pandemic year, um, they went out and had a special ceremony honoring um, his service and all of those who served, uh, served our country. Um, so that's just a little bit about, you know, the memorial for this window, for this young man. You might not know his cousin. I like to mention his cousin because his cousin was John Adams Dyer. So the two sisters, this is Grace and Jesse, the two sisters. Um, so that makes them cousins. And anyway, he also went off to war in uh, the war First World War. Uh, he went into uh, service on September of 1917. Um, he um, actually trained, was in service um, for about a year and a half, discharged in 1919. Um, so after he was discharged, he came home. You know, he served in France, and I don't know if you have any thought about what World War I was like in France with that trench warfare and the mustard gas. We don't know his specific experiences, but I know he was there and his unit saw really intense um, battle and intense um, action over there. But he comes home, he's discharged. Um, he goes and lives with his mom. A, um, he worked as an auto salesman. I see reports where he was, you know, part of this party or that party, you know, those little snippets in the newspaper I talk about. Um, but there's a really distressing headline. When he's 33 years old in 1925, um, he's found by his mom in his garage, in his car, and he had died from the fumes of the gas, from the, um, the carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, so this window reminds me of him as well, because I don't know what his service was like. I don't know what it was like for him coming home um, and then to die so tragically. He was only 33. Um, so the two cousins, you know, were both impacted by war. And this window, when I see it, I think of those two cousins that are great-grandchildren of Nathaniel and Regina Adams. So as Susan just mentioned, this window is very simple, but so beautiful. Um, I actually didn't really get a chance to really meditate on this window until recently. Um, and so just even taking a moment to look at it, uh, you see that even though there's just a few symbols, there's something really uh, beautiful about this. And so we see the very classic crown and cross symbol uh, that we've kind of talked about before is that it really is, uh, when you bring those two together, really represents the fullness of Jesus. Jesus being the one who has authority over all of creation, who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And yet with the cross, there is a humility and a sense of suffering and dying for those whom he loves so much. And so when I see those symbols put together, I think of that really is the fullness of Jesus, that great, the suffering servant, um, the one who has come to redeem us, but in a way that isn't like um, maybe some of our leaders today, um, but is someone who is just full of love and grace and compassion. And then we have on the surrounding side, I see those as palms, which kind of, once again, is that uh, call to remind us about Palm Sunday, um, our hosannas, ushering in Jesus, uh, come save us. Um, but 
the window also I noticed on the sides it looks to be like bluish um, purplish greenish uh, on the side and I couldn't help but make the meaning out of that that it might be water um, and it could be streams of living water or all kind of flowing in and through and maybe even to Christ. Um, and it just reminded me also of um, our baptismal water vows that we make with one another and that um, it's for each of us little ones that God came into the world to save us. Even when we didn't know it, God loved us. And so um, just thinking about how the cross and the crown are the fullness of Jesus, but then those waters that surround it, I couldn't help but possibly make the meaning out of that symbol or that color choice uh, that it was to bring us back to our baptism. So that's it for this week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.